The continuing energy crisis has begun to make us realize that we've been burning up the world's limited resources of fuel too fast. And unlike wood, fossil fuels, like coal and oil, are non-renewable, making energy the most treasured commodity on Earth today. It's the price of our evolving in the West, in little more than 200 years, a completely new way of life. Almost everything from mass housing to transport, industry, and even food, now depends on a vast use of energy. Instead of costing today's loaf in pennies, cost it in energy. First the wheat. Of the total energy in one loaf, this much goes on tractors, combine harvesters, fertilizers and pesticides. The power to mill it takes this much. Then just to package the resulting flour at the mill takes this proportion of the grand sum and to transport it to the baker, this much. Making the flour into a loaf and baking it uses up this much energy. Then it has to be packaged ready for the supermarket, costing this amount. And finally, getting it from bakery to sales counter, this much. The total energy put into this loaf would run an electric fire for about three hours. The snag is that for each one unit of energy we now extract as food, our new labour-saving processes have burnt up three units of energy in growing, baking, packing and transporting the bread. Eat an egg from a modern battery farm and you swallow one-sixth of the energy it took to produce it, to feed and keep the hen and get the egg to your table. In energy terms, whether it's food, transport or virtually any aspect of life today, we're probably the last of the big spenders. We can imagine only the things that we see every day in front of our eyes. That something quite different is possible, we find hard to imagine. Now, it may well be argued correctly that in the early 19th century, production units were too small to be effective. OK, with the help of concentrated fuels, we made them bigger. I believe we've overshot the mark. said we've overshot the mark questions the wisdom of the current trend to mechanize and automate everything around us. Life itself implies energy and depends on it. To live means to burn it up, but there's living within your means and there's living dangerously. His optimism assumes we will recognize the warning signs he sees around us and act before it's too late. Because we value human energy so highly, we get machines to do all the work for us. It's always seemed the obvious way out, but it could be a rather short-sighted policy. Almost all the energy we use today to keep machines going is, like oil, from fossil fuels, and it's non-renewable. The realization that non-renewable fuel resources are limited has already sent prices rocketing. It's beginning to force a rethink on how we use them. Cheap fuel gave us cheap transport, making big industrial centers seem economic. But power stations alone dissipate as much energy as they produce in just keeping cool. We need some alternative to this extravagance. Dr. E. F. Schumacher is a fuel economist. He believes that if we face the facts around us, we can find alternatives. They already exist, and he calls them the other way. Schumacher used to be economic advisor to the coal board. He accurately foretold the recent oil crisis 16 years ago, and his advice is sought by many of the developing nations, like India. He has made a name not just as a far-seeing economist, but an economist who puts people first. In his book, Small is Beautiful, now republished in several languages, he attacks current economic thinking, which he says too often equates bigger with better, 
completely ignoring the human factor. He's not, however, against technology itself, quite the opposite. This is his wheelbarrow, and it's unique. It's battery powered. It hardly uses any electricity at all, but takes a lot of the hard work out of gardening. He makes full use of his economic ideas in his own private life. He not only points out the waste of energy in the average loaf you buy in the shop, but makes his own bread and even mills his own wheat. This extreme in do-it-yourselfery may seem eccentric, but by using his own energy to mill wheat, he always has fresh flour, and like us, gets the full vitamin value from the wheat, and what's more, it's cheaper, doesn't take much time, and tastes very good. Many in the West are now taking his ideas very seriously, but it was in the third world, where the Industrial Revolution has barely begun, that his thinking has had its major impact. Despite all their problems, Schumacher foresees a reasonable future for such people, but only if they don't succumb, like us, to the glossy lure of big technology. Unfortunately, it's difficult to persuade a developing nation that there are any dangers inherent in technological progress. In one small town, I was shown the work of a potter who, uh, with marvelous skill, was making beautiful pots on the most primitive equipment. Having taken that in, I was taken out into an industrial estate which the government of India had put there in order to bring industry into rural areas. The first man I encountered was minding a machine tool, was being trained, very expensive machine tool. I asked him, after you've completed your training, will you then get into production here in this area? He said, how could I ever get hold of such a machine? All my life I'll never see the money it takes to buy such a machine. What are you going to do? He said, all I can do is to go to Bombay and look for a job. But there are already hundreds of thousands of unemployed people in Bombay. So he shrugged his shoulders. And then it occurred to me that the government of India was putting an industrial estate there in order to bring industry into the rural area, but it, in fact, was another channel to draw people from the rural area to Bombay. So it didn't work. And I reflected on this potter whom I had seen, whose equipment was worth perhaps five pounds, and this man who was trained on equipment worth 5,000 pounds. And it didn't work. The five pound technology is too primitive to make a decent living, and the 5,000 pound technology is too expensive to be within reach of the people whom it ought to benefit. And then I thought what is required is something in between. A technology much better than what they've got, and very much simpler than what we from the West or from the United States are introducing into the rural areas of India with the Indian government. Something intermediate, that I called an intermediate technology. Coming back to England, I started talking about this. Of course, people didn't immediately grasp it. They said, oh, you want something primitive. Even the Indians thought I want something primitive, not really the best, but something second best. But gradually people saw the point that the high technology, which is so capital intensive and produces so few workplaces, because there's only very limited capital, cannot solve the problem of these millions of people in the rural areas of the poor countries. And uh, having talked about it a couple of years, I felt, you know, one wants to move on from talking to doing. And with a few friends, we set up an organization. Never mind how small you start, start. The organization now has expert teams on a host of subjects. They advise third world nations on developing their own intermediate technology and on avoiding our Western trend of high capital, high energy and low manpower intensities. Schumacher and his team are often called on for advice by the governments of nations like India, Pakistan and Zambia. One result of such consultations was that IT 
the Intermediate Technology Development Group produced a catalogue of agricultural implements which don't make their users dependent on fossil fuels. These harrows and ploughs are either animal or man-powered. Previously, Western salesmen rarely offered anything but motorised machinery, and the catalogue is in big demand. Such tools look primitive, but their advantage is they only use renewable resources. What Schumacher wants is improved versions incorporating the best modern technology. I can't make the inventions that are necessary. Uh, no single organization can make them. Uh, but what can be done, and what I'm trying to do, is to suggest to my contemporaries that uh, if we look at things in a different way, then new things become possible. The typical problem is posed in many hot countries where summer baked land has to be ploughed before the autumn rains make it an impossible quagmire. Even oxen make little impression on such hard ground, but few peasant farmers can afford our alternative of a big tractor. The sort of ideas that uh, have to be systematically explored uh, is, uh, for instance, this. Is it really sensible to send two tons of tractor backwards and forwards across the land uh, pulling a curved knife called a plough. Why not uh, just pull the plough on a rope? Now in the olden days they used to do this particularly on hillsides where one, one, one couldn't do it otherwise but this technology has never been systematically perfected. It would be a tremendous simplification just uh, to pull a rope mechanically instead of having a tractor with, uh, they now have over 20 different gears. Also, although the obvious solution seemed to be an ordinary tractor, it made poor headway under trials on test plots of hard ground, using a lot of fuel for the amount of earth a standard rig could turn. As cattle can live on renewable resources and positively improve the soil, better designs of plough were tried, but more power was needed. They tried the most obvious intermediate solution, a much smaller tractor, but even when this prototype could get a grip, it barely turned the earth and only cut a ridiculously shallow groove. As this clearly wasn't the answer, a fundamentally different approach was needed. The result of their rethink was a disarmingly simple contraption which they call snail. It needs two men to work it and pulls them to the site on its tiny seven horsepower motor. In this mode, it's ideal as a cheap farm utility. In the field, it takes little time to convert it into a mini equivalent of a traction engine. As it's designed for peasant farmers, there are no sophisticated parts which can't easily be replaced. With the engine running, the power unit can now be driven to the other end of the field, leaving behind the towing assembly now converted into a plough. The whole process is more time-consuming than using a tractor, but it keeps two men usefully employed and only burns about a tenth the fuel of a big tractor. It's still in the prototype stage, but the deep furrow it cuts proves it's a practical alternative to conventional technology. The whole outfit, including plough and motor, is designed for simple construction anywhere in the world for about a hundred pounds, or less than a tenth the cost of most tractors. Extra equipment enables it to do a whole variety of jobs, but until now the tractor provided the only answer. Not surprisingly, this kind of idea is causing interest not just in those third world areas for which it was intended, but amongst smallholders here who can't afford a big tractor. A typical situation um, 
encountered in the third world uh, was this. In Zambia, they have a policy of uh, producing the maximum number of eggs because there's a protein gap in the, in the nutrition, and that gap is to be filled with protein from eggs. Uh, I visited a, a considerable number of egg farmers, and uh, they were, uh, the whole floor of a shed was covered with eggs, and they said, uh, we can't get them to market, we have no packaging. Lightheartedly, uh, my colleagues suggested, uh, surely we can make egg trays in Zambia, but nobody knew how to do, to, do, to do it. In fact, the egg trays in the world are mainly made by one big multinational company. And uh, our inquiries showed that the smallest production unit would produce about a million a month. But the whole requirement of a country like Zambia is a million a year. Asking then the question, why don't you make smaller equipment, they said this would be uneconomic. Normally, the manufacture of egg boxes needs a constant input of nearly 50 tons of waste paper a week, which then have to be converted into the pulp from which packaging is formed. This plant is one of the most modern in the world. Its super technology at its most efficient, with production maximized by the almost total elimination of the human element. The pulp is sucked into molds for vacuum forming, and the resulting egg trays dried. Over 7,000 trays an hour are produced, with speed, temperature, and pulp consistency all controlled automatically. With an investment of thousands of pounds, there's no room for human error. All this man has to do is make a quality check and, if things go wrong, press a button to call for a mechanic. Turning out over two million trays a month, plants like this in Britain fill all our needs and require other markets sometimes as far off as Zambia to make best use of the capital invested. This egg tray may look similar, but it's involved a completely new intermediate design. The boxes, when filled with eggs, not only stack, but interlock to be strapped together without the usual waste of extra crating. But what surprised the industry most is the way they're made. This unit costs about a fiftieth the price of a big plant, produces a hundredth the number of trays, but the end price per tray is about the same. that such an absurdly small-scale alternative to massive technology could either work or pay has shaken many economists. This job may not appeal to many, but when the problem is to create job opportunities, it's better than nothing. The plant both makes enough trays for any farm in Zambia and creates work for the unemployed. Also, unlike mass production, at least one operation involves skill. Here, it's telling the consistency of the pulp to see if it's ready for molding. This mold is the high technology component. Most of the other bits and pieces could be made on site. Also, in Africa, there'd be no energy needed to dry the trays. The sun would do it for nothing. Output is little more than a hundred trays an hour, but that's plenty for one single rural area. And this small-scale production has now created interest even from the big manufacturers. The almost impossible problem of enabling the third world to enter the 20th century and our age of science and technology with as little pain and as much benefit as possible has been the focus of much of Schumacher's work. But there are aspects of so-called primitive village life, which he thinks we in the West may have lost in our extreme dependence on machines. Such labor may look primitive and is unlikely to appeal to us, yet no fuel is being burnt and it's keeping someone in a useful job. Whether animal or manpower, we largely rejected such alternative energy sources with our industrial revolution. How improved transport carried coal and people to the new factories causing the growth of new cities is familiar history. What was less obvious until recently is that this industrial expansion, and it's still going on, 
was based on the exploitation of seemingly limitless fossil fuel. People left the land to become the new wage-earning consumers. Labor itself changed as mechanization made human skills redundant. In 30 years, villages like Middlesbrough grew into cities. It all happened so fast, we're still trying to make good the mistakes. But it's the less obvious ones that Schumacher suggests need most attention. For example, although working conditions have improved, even today it's still difficult to get job satisfaction when the job is serving a machine. Another legacy is that the people and factories now congested in cities are wholly dependent on a constant supply of food and fuel. Some say our coal reserves are good for 50 years. Schumacher points out that's when today's teenagers expect to be enjoying their retirement. Instead of just exploiting the last coal seams, he suggests we should be finding alternative sources of power and better ways of saving it. But most important of all, we need to discover alternative ways of life which don't wholly depend on burning billions of tons of energy. He's not just calling for economies in coal and the way we use it, but questioning the very future of those crystallizations of fossil fuel, our big cities. The continued existence of cities demands huge inputs of energy. Schumacher points out that where 95% of a population live in cities, their energy consumption is inevitably high, even on food for the remaining 5% somehow have to feed them. Faced with acres of bricks and mortar, it's difficult to see how we can ever decentralize towards smaller communities. But if Schumacher is right, and city life eventually becomes insupportable, it will be the facts, not him, that persuade a massive exodus from the tangled complexity of urban life to the greater self-sufficiency of small towns and villages. With both North Sea oil and nuclear energy just around the corner, many consider his analysis of the current facts about energy too pessimistic. But is it? To obtain energy involves us all in a price. And despite our need for power, Schumacher considers today's price too great. Take nuclear power. In order to really make nuclear energy a mass phenomenon, and when we talk about oil, we're always talking about hundreds of millions of tons, not millions, not 10 millions, hundreds of millions, even thousands of millions of tons, to make it quantitatively relevant. Uh, you can't do that with natural uranium. You have to go on to the breeder reactor. And the breeder reactor is an awesome proposition. There we produce plutonium, a most terrible substance. Uh, which uh, nature has never produced, uh, where, um, which is not only extremely radioactive, but also extremely poisonous. A lump of plutonium, which you could hold in your hand, the size of a grapefruit, if dispersed, would be enough to kill all creation. Plutonium will remain active for thousands of years, and all that time it will have to be kept safe. But it's not just the safety factor that worries some economists about nuclear power. So far, it's very largely been what's called an energy sink, which means we've spent more energy installing nuclear power stations than we've got back as electricity. And Schumacher fears they may never break even. Constructing a nuclear power station uses up a lot of energy, not just in building it, but in many other processes like mining and enriching the uranium. It takes about five years, and for all that time, the plant is a power input. It takes a year to get it going, and then at last it produces power for its fairly brief lifetime of about 25 years. But that's not the end of the story. The materials involved will remain radioactive for at least 250,000 years. Throughout that colossal period, just guarding and keeping them safe will involve some energy loss. There's another snag. Reliance on nuclear energy means lots of reactors. Even if you build one a year, when your first one starts producing power, the other five being built will still be consuming it. After 12 years with six stations now producing power, you still won't have a net power output. 
Increase the building program to cope with increasing energy needs and you'll go on pouring more power in than you get out. At present, our electricity board wants to build not 12, but 36 power stations, and by 1990. North Sea Oil could prove a similar energy sink, considering the vast energy cost of tapping it. What's worse, we now need this oil not just for transport, but agriculture. As most people live in cities, oil-intensive agriculture was developed to feed them. With so few left to work on the land, farming had to become a mechanized, chemicalized process. Farms became factories, with cheap oil providing fertilizers and herbicides to replace the good husbandry and high manpower needed in the smaller, old-fashioned organic farms. Schumacher worked on a farm for several years. He believes if we don't go back to organic methods, there soon won't be enough food to go around. He insists it's the only practical alternative to today's oil-intensive farming. As he says, the facts will persuade. Ironically, modern organic farming could equal, even outstrip, oil-based production. These recent headlines certainly seem to point the need for some alternative. Schumacher has been proved correct in the past, but if he's right yet again, does it mean all city dwellers should flee urban disintegration and growing unemployment to try and find a job on the land? Schumacher's an optimist, even when faced with the colossus of modern city life, but dislikes extremes and drastic solutions like motorways. He criticizes them as a violent answer to transport requirements themselves created by short-term thinking. He wants a new mentality where, now that cheap oil is over, we recover from travel mania and stop devouring energy as we rush ourselves around the world. It's necessary to <clears throat> open one's uh, eyesight and one's imagination uh, to <clears throat> the unnecessary complexity of so much that's going on today. For instance, I go into a shop, I want to buy a, a very straightforward, simple article called yogurt. I find it's been imported from France. Now, if we visualize this, and that yogurt is purchasable in every shop, it's a large-scale production, there's a big factory. There's another factory that makes plastic containers. The yogurt is filled into these containers, the containers have to be crated, packed loaded onto lorries, carted to the channel port, taken across the channel, probably the whole lorry, because that is supposed to be more efficient. And then that big lorry thunders through English villages, uh, delivering this to some central distribution point. From there, delivery vans into the shops, and finally the housewife buys it. Also